to 25 for GABA ergic action until 75 and 100 mg for GABA antagonistic action. And so, in the first case, you calm down the brain. In the second, and uh, you have uh, an anxiolytic effect. In the second uh, case, you stimulate the brain. And also, the pregnenolone may convert to DHEA, to cortisol, to progesterone, uh, testosterone, estrogen, and so, and so you may have many effects, uh, depending on the biotransformation of that body. But the transformation is uh, not uh, predictable because uh, the body are different from uh, one body to the others. But the dosage is from 25 to 100. Thank you very much. Professor Stegsaw, would you tell us a little bit about the availability of Melissa testing? Is it widely available? How long does it take? What's the specimen we send? What does it cost? Thank you. <laughs> uh, I would take all the time for others. I don't want to do that because uh, everything you can read on our website, www.melisa.org. Linda behind is a managing director here in London. Linda, stand up. So you can do that. We have at the time being 10 different laboratories all over the world from uh, Bill Anton's uh, uh, H uh, clinics in Melbourne to Canada to uh, five in, uh, in, uh, in Europe. Unfortunately, we still don't have laboratory in UK. If you would find a good credibility laboratory here, we could do that. We usually test panels of metals, 10 on 20. The price is about how much, Linda, for UK again? So 200 pounds. We can create your own panels for molds, for candidas, for pesticides, for foods, and so on and so on. And we would love to do a clinical trials with you. Jean, the microphone's coming to you <laughs> right away. <laughs> I think we need two of them. Jean, would you put your hand up, please, so Melissa will know how to find you? Thank you. Um, I, I wanted to thank everyone for their contributions. They've been excellent. I wanted to ask uh, Professor Hutchison if he could say something about the way in which he can do camera pictures of the tongue to identify cancer, because I've seen that before. Right. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, I have a prima lunacy clinic. What happened was... Um, um, some of the greatest advances, I think, are made by um, uh, um, lateral thinking, by finding other people to work with. That's the great thing about coming to conferences like this. Um, I was traveling on a plane, and I saw um, uh, in some magazine or other um, uh, a, a microscope that was used for looking f at metal fatigue in aircraft engines and jet engines. And I thought, ooh, well, maybe we could use that to look inside the mouth and I wanted to look at wound healing and I wanted to look at blood flow in blood vessels because that's critical about wound healing and I was particularly concerned about radiation damage then but the problem is that the microscope I hold the microscope in my hand I move the patient moves and so it's impossible to get a kind of objective measure of blood flow but I found that if you stained the nuclei in the mouth with a vital dye that is taken up by the cells you could look at the nuclei on the surface of the, of the mouth, and you can also look at the nuclei on the surface of the skin. And so in patients who have pre-malignancy, in which the vast majority of patients will never transform into malignancy, you can save them having regular biopsies by looking at them just staining the mouth with a dye or staining the skin with a dye and putting the microscope, which is a surface scanning microscope, 200 times or 500 times magnification on, and you can look at abnormal nuclei and pick those up without even doing a painful biopsy. So it saves money, it saves pain for the patient. It's not quite as good as a biopsy. If you're worried about it, you have to do the biopsy, but it's very, very good for screening and surveillance. Excuse, and excuse me, doctor. Would a scraping um, do for a bi in, in lieu of a biopsy or no? Um, there are... 
people who are doing scrapings, and there, there's a, um, uh, a laboratory in New York where you can uh, rub a, a cotton bud or something in somebody's mouth, pop it in a test tube, send it off to New York, and get that back. But that's looking at individual cells. The great advantage of this is that actually you can count the number of blood vessels in the field as well, you can, because you've got depth. You can look at the dermis as well as the epidermis. Um, so you can look at the blood vessels in the field, and obviously the blood vessels go abnormal in cancers as well. And so the blood vessel numbers, the blood vessel size and shape also help in the diagnostic process. So uh, we're validating it. We've got 1,000 patients that we've studied, and what we're trying to do is do neural networking. So instead of my looking at the computer screen and saying, oh, I'm worried about that, we're trying to get the computer to measure the size the shape of the nuclei, the number of blood vessels in the field, and also the, the, uh, the space between the nuclei, because of course the nuclei crowd or spread out um, if there's abnormality. And so we're trying to get the computer to generate a number that would say, right, this patient needs a biopsy, this patient's probably got cancer, we should get going on it straight away. In your observation, have you seen the reversal of premalignant lesions with folic acid or B vitamins or other types of uh, nutritionals? Um, there was a study done by the EORTC, the European Organization Against Cancer Research. We had great hopes for um, um, vitamin um, E derivatives, I think it was. Um, Retinol, yeah. Um, and that is vitamin E virus, isn't it? Yes. And so there's a big study done on that. I think about 10 or 15 years ago, we were very excited about that prospect. But as yet, we haven't seen any reversal. The, you do see reversal when patients stop smoking or stop taking excessive amounts of alcohol. Sometimes you get reversal. But laser excision, photodynamic therapy, vitamin supplements don't seem to work. That's disappointing. Thank it you. Is. But I mean, yeah, look, the point is that just because they don't work at the moment, there may be things found in the future, and so I've got to keep my eye posted on things that you're doing, which I haven't been doing, to find out stuff that's going on. So, I mean, it, it, it would be useful to keep in constant contact and for our research organization to do prospective randomized studies to see whether they work. So I'm happy to hear about them because just because we haven't found anything at the moment doesn't mean to say we're not going to find anything in the future. Thank yeah, you. That was my question, if you removed amalgams, because i always seen this lecture, cancer of tongue in the vicinity of, of the black amalgam, and I am not aware of the study, that mm -hmm. prospective study using this, together with Melisa test, to see if you can reverse premalignant changes. Um, okay, let's talk about it afterwards. All right. Yes, I think we have a question here. Um, um, I'm Dr. Martinez, Miguel Martinez from Barcelona and London. Um, first of all, thank you for, uh, I need to congratulate you for your fantastic uh, lectures today. Um, but I've got two questions, specific, specific questions to Professor Baranova and uh, to Dr. Pa uh, Pasaglia. First one, um, yeah, genes have in, uh, the motor of everything uh, up with the environment. And it's very important to know if we've got any predisposition to Alzheimer's disease, to cardiovascular disease, certain cancers. But the, sorry, sorry, there is a problem with the microphone. But I think it's the most important thing is to know if that gene that predisposes you to Alzheimer's disease is active or inactive. And if you can reverse that activity of the gene or if you, or you can't. And I guess that changing environmental factors, we can reverse up to 80% of that activity, and correct me if I'm wrong. 